Okay, so how do we test our Rails apps? Um, let's get into this. Uh, first, some real, real basics about testing. And I, there's a really nice thing uh, called the test pyramid. It was first uh, detailed by Mike Cohn in his book, uh, Succeeding with Agile. Nice book. You can have access. It's in uh, the O'Reilly uh, collection. So if you want to go check this out, you can. I think this, this testing pyramid comes in chapter 16 uh, called Quality. And uh, the testing pyramid is as follows. And this, this is slightly modified from what he has done. Uh, he specified. Things have uh, progressed over the years, and there's different terminology. Um, we have at the top end-to-end -end testing. In the middle, we have what might be called integration testing. There's lots of different terminology for stuff in the middle. And at the bottom, the big thing is unit testing. So these are three, three main types of testing. And the, the point of making this pyramid was to is to show and tell people this is the degree the amount that you should be testing with unit tests of your code so you should spend most of your effort and time writing unit tests you should do some integration testing and you really should not write and do too much end-to-end -end testing all right um and there's there's good reasons for this. So, but first, what is end-to-end -end testing? Um, so, end-to-end -to -end testing. Just quickly, this is uh, about basically working at the user interface level, uh, testing uh, you know whole entire workflows. It's often tied to user acceptance criteria. That's the that's the basics there. Integration is at a lower level, excludes the interface. Um, but it's still testing multiple components. Unit testing, we're down to uh, usually a single object or a single method, and we're isolating that and testing it, it by itself. Um, now, all, for end-to-end -end testing, these can be uh, manual or automated tests. The integration tests, are always uh, automated tests and the unit tests are always automated tests. Uh, what does automated mean? So automated is you do, you write code to test code. And manual is you've got a human using the user interface um, you know, clicking buttons, clicking links, and verifying, oh, that seems to work. Oh, that does not seem to work. So that's the basic idea of automated and manual. We're going to want, when we do build out our tests for our apps, we're going to want to spend most of our effort here on unit and a little on integration and even less on end-to-end. -end. Now, that being said, um, we're going to start with end-to-end -end testing. End-to-end -end testing is the easiest, certainly because it can be done manually. So you guys can uh, get your app deployed and you can manually click and check things. That's great. That's easy. You need to be systematic in how you do it, um, but that's not hard. Uh, and it's also not that hard to automate it, um, but uh, we're not going to want to do, certainly don't want to do lots of manual testing. It takes forever. And then you're actually prone not to do much testing. Um, you, you'll, you'll tend not to want to, to, to do manual testing every day. So then bugs will creep into the system. And before you know it, you have a buggy application because you haven't been keeping up with your testing. Um, so we want in general to have everything be automated. Now, so let's first, let's talk in more depth about these. Uh, so end-to-end -end testing. This is, uh, as I said, this is a user interface uh, level 
of a test. So it starts at the user interface, but of course it has to use everything in the application. Um, it goes from one end, the interface end, like we showed the browser, usually all the way to the other end, the database and back and through tons and tons of components. It goes from end to end, um, these tests. Um, it's highly useful to test an overall flow. So, for example, you can envision that you have on an e-commerce site, you test someone's ability to put things in a shopping cart and check out. There's a ton of stuff going on. There's lots of pages, lots of requests coming into the server, lots of things hitting the database, you know, requests out to credit card companies. Um, that, that's a, you, if you want to test the whole thing in, in sort of one fell uh, flow, that's an end-to-end -end test and you'd work at the user interface level for that. Um, also end-to-end -end tests, um, there, this is where much of our user acceptance criteria is covered. And by is covered, I mean, you know, we've got a list of user acceptance criteria. We're likely to be able to check those off by going through some sort of end-to-end -end test. Um, so uh, this is, there's an example template that people find helpful for thinking about uh, these sorts of tests, especially for uh, user acceptance criteria, is the idea that you would be all given this, when this, then this. So as an example, um, you know, given that I am a logged on user, let's just say I am logged in and on homepage when, so now I do some action. When I click on, let's say there's something on the page, which is log out. So when I click on log out, so what's the, so what's the context is the given, what's the state of the system? I perform an action, that's the when, then the then is the consequences, what happens? Then I am logged out. You know, and there's some indication that I'm actually logged out. And so this, you know, captures, you would have this in some user story uh, as of the acceptance criteria for the, you know, uh, maybe you have an overall user authentication uh, story. And one of the acceptance criteria is about being able to, when you're logged in, to log out from the homepage. Okay. All right. So that's, that's pretty simple. Um, and it's user acceptance criteria. It's the client's acceptance criteria. Again, it's observable from the user. And so this is why it makes a ton of sense that it's an end-to-end -end test working at the inter user interface. So if you were to demo this and show it to the client, you're not gonna show them the controller uh, that successfully logs out a user and sets a cookie and this and that. You're not gonna show, oh, see, I'll show you that in the database when I deleted this, it really was deleted. That's not what the client cares about. It's not what the user cares about. So user acceptance criteria is always, uh, is, it's expressed usually at the observable use of the actual application. And so it has to operate at this high user interface level. But we saw on the user pyramid that we don't want to have lots of this. Um, well, why is that? All right. Um, Get to that in a moment. Uh, I did, well, I just wanted to say, I'll say that first, I just wanna remind everyone, it should be obvious that you can do this manually. Um, and the great thing is though, uh, we're going to learn how to do it automatically. 
Now, until you know how to do it automatically, so let's say you're working on some code um, and you've got user acceptance criteria and you want to test it. And so let's say you don't know about all these automated forms of testing. You should write test cases. Basically, okay, I'm going to have to arrange the system to be in the current state. Then I'm going to do the following actions and I expect the following results. If I don't get the following results, the test didn't pass. And you can write those out. You wrote them out in 245 um, on one of the assignments. And you can actually go and then, all right, I've submitted my pull request. I've saved uh, my manual tests in this file. Um, it's, a, it's just a text document. It says what to do. Um, I've run all those manual tests. Everything works. So for the review, person who reviews it, they can go read that file, test your code, and agree that, yes, those tests seem like good tests. They tested the material and so forth. Um, the only downside, of course, is that there's no way, automated way to run those tests that you've written when someone else submits some other pull request in the future. Okay? Basically, as those manual tests pile up, that's work for people eventually to keep repeating and keep checking. Um, our smoke tests that we talk about with the daily build, they're a small subsample of the large set of end-to-end -end tests that you might run. Um, so again, that's because they're often, you know, often, you know, some person's done a deployment and they go and they check things out. Hey, it's smoked, it works okay. Um, so in the meantime, do manual end-to-end -to -end testing. You won't do tons of it uh, because you won't want to because it's manual. And so that, that's reasonable. And as we pro progress through the term, we'll become better at being able to automate and do the other the integration and the unit tests. And then you'll be able to get much better uh, sense that you're actually maintaining uh, the quality of the system as you work on it. So um, some points. I've said them, but let's write them down. So do not do all testing um, in end-to-end, -end, okay? Only the basics. Um, to give you an example of this, Now, show you can create an account and usually when we create an account we supply an email address. Um, now there's probably going to be a careful validation that you're given a proper uh, email address but you're not you would never with the end-to-end -end testing extensively test the email validation. Because one of the things is imagine you're doing it um, manually. Oh my goodness gracious. Every time that you want to test this, you've got to type in 10, 20 different email variants and see that they're all properly rejected um, and another whole 20 are properly accepted. There's no way you want to do that thing by hand. So what really matters is to be able to, to show, yes, we're able to create an account. That's a great end-to-end -end test. It's done. It, it, it did touch a lot of the system, you know, you, yeah, that's working. But like, and you might show, oh, and look, we get an error message when we put in a bad email address. So you like, we call it, you know, one happy path. So one successful route and one unhappy path, one sad path where, oh, it didn't work. And we got an error message. Great. You've shown it. All the other detailed testing you're going to do in automated tests lower down in the system. So just like when we put most of our code deep down in the models, most of our tests are going to be unit tests down in the models. 
And we're going to have some stuff happening with the controllers, and so we'll have some testing there. That's the integration testing. Ah, but the end-to-end -end testing, where that's basically, it's like dealing with the user interface and the view, where we're not supposed to have much logic and stuff, we're not going to put much test testing there. Um, and one of the big things is, is that even when it's automated, end-to-end -end testing um, is slow in comparison to running the unit tests and stuff. Um, but more concerning is it can be brittle um, because it's tied to the user interface. Um, and so imagine someone decides to change the words for a link. You know, someone thinks, oh, we should we should use these words rather than that word for the, this link. It's still the same link. It still clicks and takes you to the same place, but we've changed the words. It's quite likely when you write your automated user, your automated end-to-end -end test, you'll have been paying attention to, please click the link that says this. The moment you change what that link says and displays in the user interface, the test can't run anymore and it's broken. The actual functionality is not broken, but the test is broken. Um, there's some ways to get around some of this so they're not so brittle, um, but, it is, but it is a problem. So again, it can be brittle because as the user interface changes, the test can break. even if the app is still good. And so then you have these tests saying, hey, your application is not working, it's broken. It's actually the test is broken. And so now you're going in and you're making changes to the tests. So the more end-to-end -end tests you have, the more upkeep, unfortunately, that you end up doing on those tests because they keep changing. So we don't, we want, the right number of them. We don't want lots and lots. We want enough that we feel good, we can, that, our, that we're actually maintaining our user acceptance criteria, that things are still working at the basic level, but all the nitty gritty details we want in our other tests that we do. Um, now in Rails, end-to-end uh, -end tests, are called system tests when they're automated. So in Rails, automated end-to-end -end tests are called system tests. And even and because they're the tests that you least want to run because they're slow and so forth and so on, in Rails you even have to specify explicitly, please run the system tests for me. The default is to run all the integration and uh, unit tests. So if you're like Rails, run the tests. It's going to run the integration and the unit tests. You actually have to go to extra effort to say, Rails, I'd like you to run the systems tests. Um, one of the reasons the automated system tests are slow is partly because it has to do all of this reading and everything of the, um, has to actually be like a browser. And in fact, uh, now our, our automated end-to-end -end tests will be pretty fast because we're not going to be using JavaScript and so the browser can be very lightweight. But if you have an application that has any JavaScript in it, you actually need to launch a full-on browser. So just like Chrome, okay, you launch a version of Chrome and then you control Chrome to actually go through and do these actions on the web pages. Um, and, and that's just, it is, it's a huge amount of computation for these small tests. Now for an individual user, ah, who cares? You know, the browser works fast enough. It seems all good and stuff, but again, your goal is ended up to have lots of testing and you want the computer to run it and run it really fast. Well, if you've got lots of testing, 
you don't want it to go at the pace of like a user. You want it to be really fast. Going through the browser is slow. All this end-to-end -end testing is slow. So yep, that's one of the biggest things. But the other thing is they break on you. All right, so that's end-to-end -end testing. It's, a real, it's gonna be the way that we get into testing our Rails app because first we're gonna be manually testing. Now we're gonna to work to then change those into automated tests. Then next we'll start to learn how to do our integration and unit tests. So let's, let's talk just briefly about the integration and unit tests before we conclude here. So integration tests, again, their big thing is that they test multiple components. but they exclude the user interface. So they work a level below that. They get rid of that whole, basically that first tier. Um, in Rails, again, these are automated tests. Um, in Rails, um, an integration test is all about testing the controller, okay? So you test the controller, so integration is, is at the level of the controller in uh, Rails, which makes sense. The controller, again, is going to talk to these models, then it's going to process and create this view and return this response. So it's going to still go across lots of components. We're not going to try to isolate the controller from those components. We're going to actually want it to actually use the models and everything and see, see what the, the controller returns as its response to see whether it works correctly. Um, and so we test the controller. Um, this is the really sort of cool part of, of this by, and I'm going to put in quotes, sending because it's, it's done at a algorithmically, it, it's, it's at the code level. It's not sending an actual HTTP request uh, out over the wire, but it's by sending the equivalent of an HTTP request directly to Rails, not from the UI. And so what's meant, what we mean by that is that we're able to actually say in our test, oh, post to this path the following data. So we, from a browser, we need an HTML form to be filled out and submitted to cause a post in the data to go to the browser. But here, we can actually run our, our code. It never touches a browser, never, never leaves the computer where our web server is running, where Rails is. And it can say, oh, yeah, do a post of the following data. And we prepare it in a nice hash. Basically, we give it the params. And so it goes ahead and it says, oh, yeah, here's a post to this path. And we're going to go ahead and provide you these params. So you, you directly go, you, you go straight on into basically, oh yeah, I'm gonna call a controller because I know that it's routed to a controller, this post in this path, and I'm gonna give it this data. And then that controller runs and we can check to see what the side effects and what actually changes and what the response is of the controller. Um, it's, an, it's a nice thing. Um, it lets, it lets us get rid of worrying about, you know, did we actually make that form correctly in the view or, you know, there's, is the problem with, we made some mistake in our view and the user interface part portion is broken, or is the problem down lower in the system in the controller or the model? Well, at least we get rid of this top layer and we can more better, we can better isolate where the, that error is when we're testing. And then again, the lowest level of testing where we'll do most of the work eventually is unit testing. And again, this is, you're gonna work at a single object. So you're gonna test a model, uh, or maybe you're testing some particular methods. If you think about uh, some of the, like the first lab that we did with the session, uh, session and we made that session helper. Maybe we're just going to test those individual methods somehow. Uh, so, but there, our goal here is to do this um, 
you know, you, you isolate the object from the rest of the system. So we want to only test that as its unit. Whereas an integration test, no, we're really happy. It's going to talk lots of stuff. End to end test, its very name is we're going to test lots of stuff. Unit test, oh, we, we just want to, we just want to test this piece and we don't want to be concerned about anything else in the system because as other stuff changes, if it affects, affects our test of this, we're not really testing this thing only. We want to test only this object. And so if there's a problem with it, we want to know, and it's really, really isolates the errors. Um, all right. So, um, and again, so this is all about, um, largely all about the models and other classes we create. And so let's test those individually and make sure that the individual parts work. And so you can think about this as any sort of large system that you make. Um, you know, let's say you're, you're building something out of electrical components. Well, you're going to put it all together. It would make sense if you wanted to be sure that it was going to work as you expected that before you put the component like on the circuit board, you'd check to see that it, it, it actually was alive and working. Um, then as well, likely you, your, your electronics would be made out of multiple components. And so we probably put them together, these pieces, we have unit test them. Then we at the component level, it's kind of like an integration test. We could have other integration tests that have component talking to component, but then the final, like this notion of end-to-end -end tests would be, oh yeah, that circuit board's inside of, you know, let's say our, our, our radio and you know inside our car or whatever and we're pressing the buttons and hey yeah it works i get to listen to the music um and so we can you can envision that you can all sorts of things you know if you're a mechanical engineer any sort of engineer it's oh first i'm going to make sure my my individual pieces work then as i put the pieces together i'm going to see that those larger systems work and then eventually we're going to check out and test the whole entire system um, but yeah, at the whole entire system level, we, we sure don't want to be relying upon it to find any problems in these thousands and thousands of parts, partly because it's going to be really hard to figure out where the problem is. So the unit tests are great. It lets us isolate where, where problems are um, and fix them, or at least and make sure that we're pretty confident before we put them together with anything that they work on their own. Um, that's the great thing about unit testing. And unit testing runs the fastest of all, um, partly because it's all this isolated and small aspect. So we have lots and lots of unit tests, but they run blindingly fast, gives us a lot of uh, security and makes us believe that likely our, our basic parts work. And then as we put the parts together, we know we're working with working parts and then the integration and the end-to-end -end testing, and that wraps it all up. All right.